By faith, Abraham obeyed God, going out, not knowing where he was going. So if you say, but what if, but what if, but what if, but what, but what? That's the point. <laughs> you don't know. You get it? If you only take steps that you know exactly everything that happens when you put the foot down, that's not faith. Why hello my fellow apes, I'm Stephen Woodford and today we're going to continue our commentary on Dr. William Lane Craig's best responses to the best atheist arguments, this time focusing our attention on both figurative interpretation and whether or not faith and reason are reconcilable. I don't think they're reconcilable. Dr. Tyson is not well read in this area. But before we do this, I have the best news. Within a few days, all Kickstarter orders will have been dispatched, and at which point the remaining stock will become publicly available. So if you'd like to be informed of the moment you can get your grips on this beautiful box of linen, then please register on the mailing list linked below. You'll be galileing and hitch-slapping your friends at once. Galileing? Ga Galileoing? Whatever. Galileo! Anyhow, let's get to this. Do you give people who make this case that that was the beginning and that there had to be something that provoked the beginning, do you give them an A at least for trying to reconcile faith and reason? Um, I don't think they're reconcilable. What do you mean? Well, well, so let me say that differently. All efforts that have been invested by brilliant people of the past have failed at that exercise. They just fail. And so I don't, I, I don't, the track record is so poor that going forward I have essentially zero confidence, near zero confidence, that there will be fruitful things to emerge from the effort to reconcile. Augustine of Hippo once said that faith is to believe what you do not see, the reward of this faith is to see what you believe, which is an echo of Hebrews 11 verse 1 which states, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This is quite obviously the type of faith that Tyson was referring to, as opposed to the mere synonym of trust which is based on sufficient reason. You know, the whole equivocating theistic nonsense that they have faith in God in exactly the same way that I have faith that this chair will hold my weight. That's not faith! Now, when Craig responds to Tyson's statement on faith, he conflates it with a subsequent statement from Tyson regarding scriptural interpretation. What he goes on to talk about is the opening chapter of Genesis. That is apparently what he thinks he means by faith. And so for the purpose of context, I'm going to play that segment now. Here we go. They're not if very you knew nothing about science, <laughs> and you read, say, the Bible, the Old Testament, which in Genesis is an account of nature. That's, that's what that is. And I said to you, give me your description of the natural world based only on this. You would say the world was created in six days and that stars are just little points of light much lesser than the sun. And in fact, they can fall out of the sky, right? Because that's what happens during, during the um, revelation. One of the signs that yeah. the second coming is that the stars will fall out of the sky and land on earth. So it's even right that means you don't know what those things are. Everybody who tried to make proclamations about the physical universe based on Bible passages got the wrong answer. So what happened was, when science discovers things and you want to stay religious, or you want to continue to believe that the Bible is, is unerring, what you would do is, you would say, well, let me go back to the Bible and reinterpret it. Then you'd say things like, oh, they didn't really mean that literally, they meant that figuratively. The observation that Tyson is referring to here is, at least for me, one of the most revealing facets of religion. From the Enlightenment onward, the perpetual onslaught of science has walloped religious literalism into metaphor. The confidence of creationism has been eviscerated by natural selection. The hubris of geocentrism has succumbed to heliocentrism. The voyage of Noah's Ark has been buried by the avalanche of geology, and the depravity of demonic exorcism has been vanquished by epileptic medicine. <laughs> that is, I should say, at least for most people. Occult practices seem to be very real. In a secular society, as science advances, religious literalism diminishes. Give it a few hundred years or so, and Christianity will wilt to the pathetic woo-woo of Jordan Peterson. God is how we imaginatively and collectively represent the existence and action of consciousness across time. Okay, so with all the context in place, let's hear Craig's response. I, I mean, it's very, very clear that Dr. Tyson is not well-read in this area. He, he's just um, sharing his opinion. 
and that's evident in the way the question is framed. Faith and reason, are they reconcilable? Those are such general terms as to be meaningless. What in the world is even meant by faith and reason? And yet he thinks they're irreconcilable. Given that Tyson explicitly referred to an account of nature based purely on the Old Testament, I think the definition of faith that he's using is abundantly clear. It's the Augustinian variation, the strong sense of the word, in which one believes something without adequate reason. That is, in fact, why faith is considered the antithesis of reason. I would have really enjoyed listening to Craig respond to this, but unfortunately, he doesn't. Rather, and as said earlier, he avoids this objection. Now, what he goes on to talk about is the opening chapter of Genesis. That is apparently what he thinks he means by faith, and that all efforts to reconcile that um, with science have failed. Now, there's a lot to be said about this. As the interviewer suggested, the idea that the universe had a beginning at some point in the finite past and was created by God, as Genesis declares, is fully reconcilable with modern astrophysical cosmology, which also posits an absolute origin to the universe about 13.8 billion years ago. During a debate with the physicist Sean Carroll in 2014, Craig claimed, as he just has here, an absolute origin of the universe by invoking primarily the Board Guth for Lincoln theorem. In 2003, Arvind Board, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to show that any universe, which is on average in a state of cosmic expansion throughout its history, cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a beginning. All the evidence we have says that the universe had a beginning. And Carroll, with one of the most phenomenal hitch slaps of all time, not only explained why modern cosmology doesn't posit an absolute beginning of the universe, but got Alan Guth himself to say as much. In case you don't trust me, I happen to have Alan Guth right here, one of the authors of the Borde Guth Vilenkin theorem. Alan, what do you say? He says, I don't know whether the universe had a beginning. I suspect the universe didn't have a beginning. It's very likely eternal, but nobody knows. Now, how in the world can the author of the borde guth vilenkin theorem say the universe is probably eternal for the reasons I've already told you? The theorem is only about classical descriptions of the universe, not about the universe itself. Now, just as a side note, notice how confidently Craig still asserts an absolute beginning of the universe, despite physicists correcting him face to face. One of Craig's strengths insofar as he champions Christianity is how confidently he expresses himself. He speaks with way more confidence about physics and mathematics than actual physicists and mathematicians. From here, for the sake of staying on track, I'm going to avoid any other distractions and focus solely on Craig's response to Tyson's claim of theists having to reinterpret their scripture. So it's demonstrably false that faith and modern science cannot be reconciled, as the way Dr. Tyson says. Now, with respect to the Genesis account, it's very important to understand that this is not offering a natural account of the origin of the world. This is an account that uh, works with the presuppositions of the culture, and the assumptions that were made by those to whom it was written to make the theological point that the stars and the sun and the moon, the animals, the things in the world are not deities, as was believed in ancient Mesopotamia, but rather these are just ordinary, natural things which the transcendent God has made. And that central theological point uh, is not dependent upon the sort of worldview assumptions that may be taken for granted in this chapter. It's not a chapter about uh, cosmology or biology. It's a chapter about how God is the source of the things in the natural world, and that therefore they are not to be worshipped. Okay, so Tyson's point was that everyone who made confident proclamations about the universe based on biblical passages got the wrong answer. Got the wrong answer. And that once science exposed this fact, theists had to significantly reinterpret their Bible through the prism of metaphor. Then you say things like, oh, they didn't really mean that literally, they meant that figuratively. Or to put it another way, the bold assertions, the confident proclamations of how to interpret the Bible, which, let's not forget constituted law, turned out to be abysmally, embarrassingly wrong. 
and Craig's response is to boldly assert, to confidently proclaim how to interpret the Bible. It's not a chapter about uh, cosmology or biology. It's a chapter about how God is the source of the things in the natural world, and that therefore they are not to be worshipped. Indeed, he confidently claimed how to interpret the Bible many times over. Here's another example. As I said, the purpose of Genesis 1 is not to give an account of nature. It is not um, a science book. The purpose of Genesis 1 is to show that the things that exist in the world are just creatures rather than deities to be worshipped and served, that God is the transcendent creator and designer of everything that exists. Hence, as opposed to refuting Tyson's claim, Craig demonstrated it, and with all the same assured confidence as his predecessors, who wielded radically more literal interpretations. In fact, there's plenty of theologians today that wield those literal interpretations with the same confidence as Craig. However, he implies that a literal interpretation has not been the norm throughout Christian history. But in any case, I, I don't think that taking the passage non-literally is a later um, imposition as Neil deGrasse Tyson says, Throughout the history of Christianity, biblical literalism has been the status quo, as the embers of Galileo Galilei, Giordano Bruno, and Michael Sivetus testify, to name just a few. Bruno, for instance, was burnt alive for positing that the Earth revolves around the Sun, that the stars are actually suns with potential planets of their own, and that those planets might harbour life forms, which are all views that Craig himself holds. For all we know, there could be intelligent life forms scattered throughout the universe. Indeed, Craig's figurative interpretation of the Bible would have got him burnt at the stake during the Christian Golden Age, which is more accurately known as the Dark Ages. Yet, he casually dismisses the observation that Christian interpretation has become, due to scientific exposure, ever more figurative, by one, claiming that his figurative interpretation is the correct one, and two, by implying that literalism has never been the status quo. Now, every ancient Israelite knows how long it takes for, say, a date palm to spring up out of the ground and grow into a tree and finally bear dates. Uh, for this to happen within 24 hours, he would have to be imagining something like a, a time-lapse film being run on fast forward so that the tree would pop up out of the ground, grow into a, a huge tree, and pop out the fruit on it all of a sudden within a short amount of time. And I don't think that's what the author of Genesis had in mind. Yeah, and every ancient Israelite knows that if someone claims to have resurrected after three days, then they're either lying or they're mentally ill. But I guess that Craig is happy to invoke miracles when it comes to him preserving what he interprets as literal, and happy to reject miracles, such as a plant growing at extraordinary speed, when it comes to a passage that he interprets as metaphor. And of course, he confidently state his mismatch of literal and metaphorical interpretation is correct, with more confidence than I have that this chair will hold my weight. That's not faith! Anyhow, I'm Stephen Woodford, and as always, thank you kindly for the view, and an extra special thank you to my wonderful patrons and those of you who have supported the channel via other means. Talking of which, a fantastic way to support the channel whilst having a blast is to get your hands on Debunked. Please follow the pinned link below for details.